the love and name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. New Life, well, thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you guys this morning. And just so you know, I do have a cold. This isn't what I normally sound like. So next week you'll be grossly disappointed if you think about this cool like uh, AM radio voice for the foreseeable future. Just so you know a little bit more about me, my name is Cameron Schweitzer. I have the pleasure of serving as Gateway Seminary here in Fremont as the new director of the campus. I've been here for about seven months. Uh, my wife, myself, and my little baby Malachi moved up here in March from Southern California. We are in, loving the Bay. Uh, to me, the contest between Southern California and Northern California has no question. The Bay Area is better. But I did grow up in the Inland Empire, so if I grew up like in San Diego, maybe that'd be a different conversation. Uh, but I've worked for Gateway Seminary the last eight years in the admissions office doing various roles. I've studied at Gateway Seminary doing both my MDiv and my PhD. Before that, I was a student at California Baptist University where I studied philosophy and theology. Uh, unlike some of you young folks, I did not grow up in the church. I was saved just shy of my 18th birthday when a, a friend who was very close to me invited me to church and I went on a day like this and I heard the gospel and I was radically converted. So 12 years ago, if any of my classmates would have uh, said it, no one would have thought that I'd be working at a seminary, uh, a professor of theology and doing what I'm doing. But God's sovereign and he's good. And I, I hope to be able to share the, the truth of that from the word over the next few months as we get to share this time together. Uh, as you guys may know, you go through the uh, Gospel Project curriculum week to week to sort of march you through the Bible. And in this particular week, we're looking at Acts chapters 21 to 23 with this idea of continuing through opposition. So before I pray, I wanted to read our text from this morning to prepare our hearts, and then we will go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll jump in. So that's Acts chapter 21, starting in verse 7. So that's Acts chapter 21, starting in verse 7. And I'm reading from the NASB, just so you guys are aware. And it says this, when, he, when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemas, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day we left and came to Caesarea, and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his feet and his hands and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. And hear what Paul said. And Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am not only ready to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And since we could not persuade him, we fell silent and remarked, The will of the Lord be done. Let us pray. Our great King, enthroned on high, we thank you, O Lord, that your name is power, that your name is filled with glory and with might. Our God, we thank you that in your sovereign mercy, you allow us to be your children, children through your Son, Jesus Christ, who has saved us and ransomed us from hell and from Satan and from our own sin. Now, God, we thank you that you've given us your spirit, and that in that spirit we can refer to as our Ava, as our Father. Lord, we thank you that your spirit binds us together as a people, that we are your people, O oh God, of your pasture. Lord, we thank you that your spirit continues to equip us and to fill us and to empower us to be about your work. So, our God, we pray that we would learn this morning what it would be from the Apostle Paul to continue through opposition to remain faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to not shrink back when things get hard or when the opposition grows fierce. Lord, we pray that you would speak this morning to your people, for we are listening. God, I pray for myself that my words would be your own, that your spirit would empower me and that you'd build your church, O oh God, and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. O oh Lord, would you act for your glory and for our joy. Amen. 
In the late 19th century, there was a very famous missionary by the name of Peter Cameron Scott. And Mr. Scott's dream was to establish a line of mission centers that would go from the eastern horn of Africa through Africa's inland interior and stretch all the way from the Indian to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, as a young man, Mr. Scott had committed himself to a lifetime of Christian service for God's mission among the nations. And Mr. Scott was unconcerned with how obscure or humble those circumstances of that call might be. And with that commitment in mind, in 1890, at the age of 23, Mr. Scott set sail for the east coast of Africa, firmly believing that this was the place to where the Lord was calling him. On that day, when he reached that coast of that far shore, his spirits surely were at fever pitch when he began his life in humble service among the unreached tribes of Africa's inland interior. But like many other faithful Christian soldiers in that generation of missionaries, far beyond our 20th century with its modern medicinal models, that missionary contracted malaria, and Mr. Scott was forced to return to Britain on another nearly year-long voyage back home. Some months later, Mr. Scott's health returned to him, and he was ready again to go to Africa. But now this time, his spirit was especially filled with joy because his brother, John, would be going with him back to Africa to reach the nations. However, that joy would fade once more when they reached the Golden Shore a second time because his brother John, like Peter before him and many others before him, quickly fell to the African fever. And in a few months, that brother died. So John Scott, within a few months, became yet one more missionary in the white man's graveyard as it was called. And with his own hands, Peter Scott built his brother's crude coffin and hewed out his shallow grave and put him in the ground. And as Peter loomed over his now deceased brother's body, there were no church bells or flowers or loved ones who'd gathered around to honor that deceased man. One brother, alone with his thoughts in Africa's inland interior, Peter, standing there in the eerie plains of Africa, as he later recounted, had a crisis of faith. His mind was filled with questions. He needed to know whether I should call it quit, call it quits and return home, because he had a promising career in the Italian opera if he just returned home, or if he should continue on in his toil in Africa. Should he recommit himself to preaching the gospel, even if it cost him everything? As you recounted, being hard-pressed between the two, the flesh trying to vie with power over the spirit, Peter felt as if his mind was to rend itself to pieces. But he said at one moment, like the light breaking through dark clouds, Peter, though it was hard, his choice became crystal clear to him. He needed to remain faithful to the gospel and preach it in the places in Africa where the gospel has never gone, whatever the cost might be. So then there, Peter, next to his brother's graveside, recommitted himself, whatever the cost, to stay in Africa and reach those lost Africans. But a few months later, that solemn moment must have seemed like a cruel joke from the Most High. For but a few months later, Peter Scott was again forced to return to to England after having his health fail him once more. Now by this time, he had spent as many days sick in the bowels of a boat as he had preaching the gospel to lost Africans. So it's not unreasonable to suppose, as he went back to England now for the second time, that many of his loved ones, his family and his friends, were telling him to give up, to quit, to come back. You have a promising career in the opera that you can pursue. Surely God doesn't want you in Africa. And Friends, I'm sure as he was there alone in the hull of a ship, teetering in the Atlantic, he was tempted to go back. He was discouraged, tempted to call it quits once and for all. But friends, Peter Scott did not quit. For in London, in that second trip back, something remarkable happened. God had encouraged him as he went and visited the tomb of another very famous missionary who you've probably heard of named David Livingston, who himself had also brought the gospel over three decades to lost Africans. And on Mr. Livingston's tomb was a particular verse that propelled Mr. Livingston into Africa over countless Decades of trial and hardship and hard hearts. Specifically, Christ's promise from John 10, 16. 
where it says, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also must I bring. They will hear my voice, and they will follow me. The words of that promise propelled Mr. Scott back to Africa to finish his mission, whatever the cost. So he got on a boat one more time and sailed back over another year-long voyage to get back to the eastern coast of Africa. He wanted to be just like his hero, David Livingston, to take the gospel to Africa's interior, whatever the cost. And friends, the cost was great for Mr. Scott. For only 14 months now into his third voyage, with but a few converts under his ministry, in December of 1896, Peter succumbed yet again to the brutal African environment, but this for the last time. He died in the hand of his mother, and he never got to see his dream come to fruition. He never got to see the establishment of the Africa Inland Mission during his lifetime. But that organization he founded, Africa's Inland Mission, or AIM, which still exists to this day, was at the cost of his own blood. For although that mission nearly dissolved in the next year after many more died or quit and gave up and go, went back home, his vision lived on far after him, even down to this day. And there is now, under AIM, a stretch of missions works from the eastern horn of Africa through Africa's inland interior, and in fact now in every country in Africa. His work, friends, was not in vain, but it cost him everything. It cost him his health. It cost him his success. It cost him his brother's life. And the question I want us to ask this morning is this. What kept that man going? Numerous bouts with malaria, a dead brother, hostile tribesmen, and countless days sick in the hull of a ship not getting to preach the gospel to lost Africans. All of these things would have caused many to call it quits. His friends and his loved ones told him, give up. Surely God does not want you there. But Mr. Scott did not quit. And I want to know why. What is it that so affected Mr. Scott's vision of life that he would be willing to sacrifice everything for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Now, friends, I, can, we, I believe that we can find our answer from the Apostle Paul, a man after whom Mr. Scott's life was patterned. For as you know, Mr. Paul, uh, Paul the Apostle himself knew what it was to suffer for the gospel, did he not? Even in Acts 9, when Jesus called him to himself on the road to Damascus, as the light overpowered him and he fell down to the ground, do you remember what Jesus told him? He told him that he'd be called as a light to the Gentiles, but he also told him how much he would suffer for his sake. And what we're going to see in, his, in this text this morning from Acts 21 is an example of how Paul suffered and his response to the prospect of it. And what I would like for us to consider this morning is not merely the fact that the Apostle Paul suffered and continued in ministry through opposition and hardship, because this isn't merely a history lesson. More than that, I would like us to know how Paul persevered in ministry through all of his opposition and his suffering. I desire for us to know Paul's secret, as it were, to persevering in ministry and life through the midst of suffering and opposition, that we might do the same. I want us to know Paul's secret of perseverance in the face of opposition heartache of loss, the same secret that Mr. Scott had that sent him to Africa three times despite all of the cost. And friends, we need to know this secret, whether you are young or old, for whether we want to face this reality or not, if we desire to live a faithful life for Christ, we will suffer, whether you like it or not. We will suffer in this life. And church, how much more real ought this prospect seem to us now in the face of what we're witnessing over the last few weeks of a twisted, godless Western world that can side with terrorists who behead babies rather than God's people? Paul's were hearing on, Christ, on uh, college campuses to rid all Christians from their midst. Friends, we cannot be surprised then 
when the fiery trials come upon us, as if something strange were happening. For listen to the Bible's testimony about the impending prospect of our suffering. As it says in Philippians 1, It has been granted to you, brother and sister, that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Christ, but you should also suffer for him. God's granted that to you. 2 Timothy 3, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All of us who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. As it says in Acts 14, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom. Jesus says in Matthew 10, you will be hated by everyone for my name's sake. As he says in John 15, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. As Jesus says in Matthew 10, Behold, I send you out as sheep among the midst of wolves. They will devour you. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who tries to keep his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will keep it. Friends, it's very clear there are many more verses to which I could appeal. If you want to be faithful to Christ, you will suffer in this life. That's been promised to you. Friends, so we should earnestly desire then to learn what kept Peter Scott and the Apostle Paul faithful to Christ in the midst of severe opposition and affliction. Because we too will face opposition and affliction. And we want to remain faithful and make much of Jesus when we suffer. For friends, it's not a matter of if, but when. So you too ought to know the secret that these men have. Because whether you choose, and I hope many of you would, young as you are, to live a life like Peter Scott, and forsake everything, and take the gospel to a hostile place or a hostile people. For friends, whether you remain faithful to the gospel here in the Bay Area, as this area continues to grow more hostile to Christianity, and you sacrifice everything to support those who take the gospel to lost nations. And here, while you give, you keep calling your friends and your co-workers, your neighbors, to faith and repentance in Jesus Christ. And as you do so, you know you will lose loved ones and friends and jobs and security because you'll be called intolerant and narrow-minded, any kind of phobic that they might love to heap upon you. Or friend, whether you choose, or rather God chooses, to strike you with suffering, be it sickness, or lost income, or heartache from friendship, or whatever various trials you might face, the question is the same, and it's this. How will you remain faithful and make much of Christ in the face of suffering and opposition? That's what we want to know. How will I suffer well? and make much of Christ. That's why I want want us to consider the Apostle Paul, his manner of life, and particularly his secret to remaining steadfast in the face of opposition and suffering. With that being said, I want to take us back to Acts 21 and look particularly at the last few verses. Remember, Agabus comes, he has a prophecy, the Holy Spirit says, as he's bound his own hands with Paul's belt, so will the Jews do to the one who goes to Jerusalem. They will hand him over to the Gentiles. Verse 12, when we heard this, as well as the local residents, we began begging Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. And what does Paul say in reply? What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die into Jerusalem for the name of Christ. And since we could not persuade him, we became quiet and said, the will of the Lord be done. And after these days, verse 15, we got ready and went to Jerusalem. Friends, after Paul's many missionary journeys detailed in Acts, here in chapter 21, we find him in his last one. With his face set towards Jerusalem like flint, he will soon be unable to travel and preach the gospel as he desires, as he wills. For now, as the text says, it was the Lord's will which was to be done. He will be going to Jerusalem, and neither devil 
or man will stop him. And for Paul, whether that meant imprisonment or death, if he continued on that way, he was ready to go on that way. For as he says elsewhere, my desire is for Christ to be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to remain on in the flesh would mean more fruitful labor for him, so long as the Lord would will. Or, if he were not to remain on in the flesh as the Lord would will, then he would at long last receive the fruits of his labor. For Paul, as he says in Philippians, to live or to die, whichever way the Lord would will for him to walk, it would be gained for him. So long as the name of the Lord Jesus is exalted in Paul's body, the Apostle Paul would align his will with the will of his Lord, Jesus Christ. And in the next two chapters of Acts, we see what the Lord willed for Paul's body. In Jerusalem, Paul would be unjustly captured by the Jews for a crime that he did not commit. He would be beaten senselessly by his kinsmen until the Gentiles intervened. Paul would stand in the dock unjustly accused. He'd be cast into prison and bound with chains, though he had done nothing wrong. Yet, for all this, Paul says, I am ready not only to be bound, but to die in Jerusalem for the name of Christ. His will be done. Now, friends, for those of you who know the Bible, what's described here in Acts 21-23 barely scratches the surface of the extent and depth of Paul's suffering and his endurance of what he did for Jesus Christ. In fact, these little trials seem but a trifling. For you do not recall how he summarizes the glories of his blessed apostleship, his body filled up as it was with the afflictions of Christ in 2 Corinthians. Oh, how lavish was his boasting in 2 Corinthians when he says, In whatever respect anyone else is bold, I too am bold. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm speaking as if I'm insane. I'm more so. Here it is. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent adrift in the sea. I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers and robbers and countrymen and Gentiles in the city and the wilderness and among the false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst without food and cold and exposed. And apart from such external things, there's on me the daily pressure of all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I am to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ knows that I am not lying. He faced a lot of suffering. He bore in his body, as he said, the afflictions of Christ. To have been whipped over 200 times would have left the man hunched over and his back scarred indefinitely beaten with rods, stoned, imprisoned, lost at sea. What was it in Paul's heart that made him so fearless? What did he know? What was his secret that allowed him to endure such afflictions and opposition throughout the course of his ministry and not give up? What was it that Mr. Peter Scott knew that sent him to Africa three times to suffer and to die? For they both faced hardship, after hardship, Paul faced it from Jews and Gentiles as he sought to remain faithful to Christ. Paul lived a life of suffering for the gospel. And all of this from the inception of his ministry when the Lord Jesus thundered into his life <clears throat> and revealed to him that he would not only be his chosen instrument to bear his light in the darkness of the Gentiles, but Jesus told him, this light that you will bear, Paul, to the Gentiles will be the burning of your own flesh and my afflictions as you embody my suffering to the lost. Paul knew then what it was to suffer for Christ. But friends, what was his secret? How could he endure? What might he have to teach us that we too could patiently and faithfully suffer 
on behalf of our Lord through whatever affliction or hardship he might put in our path. That's what we want to know. But friends, it will not be an easy secret to swallow because suffering is hard. But I believe that we can hear this secret, take it into our hearts, and be transformed to be fearless and bold, even as the Apostle Paul or Peter Scott was. And that secret of Paul's ability to persevere in the face of severe affliction, of of severe suffering, is found in Philippians chapter 3. This secret of how Paul persevered through so much affliction, through so much opposition, he details for us in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 7. And in this wonderful text, we see that there are three truths that Paul held close to his heart that allowed him to suffer well for Christ, which I believe can help us to endure too. Philippians 3, starting in verse 7, this is a very famous text. As he says, Whatever things were gained to me, these things I've counted as lost because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that's derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already grasped it all or I've already become perfect, but I press on if I may also take hold of that for which I've also been taken hold of by Christ. Brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Friends, that is Paul's secret embodied in those verses. Now let me point out the three things to you. First, the first part of Paul's secret is this. Paul counted everything as loss. The apostle Paul counted everything as loss. Verse 7, whatever things were gained to me, I've counted them as loss. Verse 8, More than that, I count all things to be lost. Also, verse 8, I count the loss of all things as rubbish. Friends, Paul views all things that he once had in this life, which were benefits to him, they're now loss or rubbish in his sight. For example, all the confidence that he could have in himself, he counts as nothing, as we heard of in 2 Corinthians. His identity as a Jew, his religious pedigree, his zeal, his knowledge, his talents, and his skills, he accounts them as worthless. But not only that, he counted all things, not things which were once gained to him, loss as well. That's what we see in 2 Corinthians. His health, his safety, his livelihood, his security, his reputation, his plans, all of it. Every good thing that Paul could have in this life, he said is of no value. It's rubbish. It's rubbish. Now, though, it's important to know why Paul had this perspective. I've seen everything in his life as rubbish. Because if you're not careful, what would happen is you could think of Paul sort of like an ascetic monk who merely hated worldly things because they're worldly. That's not why Paul counted them as rubbish. He had a basis for his claim that all things are rubbish in his sight. And this is point two. In in that text, what you see is that Paul counts everything as loss. Why? Because of the surpassing worth of of Jesus. Verse 7, I have counted all things as loss for the sake of Christ. Verse 8 and 9, I count all things as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. Friends, it is Jesus Christ's supreme value That enables the Apostle Paul to put loss over everything that he once counted as gain. He can even consider all the good things that he had in this life as mere rubbish and not fret over the fact that he lost them. That's why Paul can lose all things and suffer all things for Christ. 
because Paul views Jesus to be of such an incalculable value that anything Paul could have or desire to have in this life or anything that could be taken from him when compared to Christ is without any true value. For this reason, Paul can have everything and anything taken from him. He can suffer whatever hardship for Christ and truly have lost nothing because Jesus is his invaluable treasure. But you can ask, though, how could Paul view Jesus like that versus his earthly goods? Because Jesus wasn't in the flesh with Paul as his earthly goods were, were they? He didn't see or have Jesus in the same way he could see or have worldly things that he was losing or counting his loss. So what was it that allowed him to be motivated in such a way to view these things as loss or as rubbish in comparison to Christ? And this is the third point from the text. Paul could count everything as loss on account of the surpassing worth of Christ because he knew that one day he was going to see Christ face to face. This life was not all that he had. Listen to what he says in verses 8, 9, and 10, and 14. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, and I count everything as rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, that I may know him, so I press on toward the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul wanted to remain faithful in his call and continue to count all things as loss because it was by perseverance that he knew he would get to go home one day to his Savior. And his Savior was his greatest treasure. Paul wanted Christ. He wanted to gain Christ. He wanted to know Christ and to be found in Christ. For Paul knew that Christ was that valuable. He is more valuable than any valuable thing his earthly hands could ever grasp. And Paul knew that one day, what he saw now by faith would be made plain to him by sight in the day to come. He knew that one day he would no longer be forced to see Christ dimly as if through a mirror. For one day, Paul would see Christ fully, face to face. The hope of one day seeing Christ face to face his invaluable treasure, that's what allowed Paul to suffer everything and to count everything as loss as he did. Think of how he puts it like this in Philippians 1. And this helps us connect the dots to his suffering. It is my earnest expectation and hope that Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain." Paul made much of Jesus in his suffering because that was living for Christ. For Paul, that meant willing to suffer the loss of all things because whether he may have lost them or whatever he may have lost, he never lost Christ. And Christ was his supreme treasure. So then even after earthly good, after earthly good was taken from him, even as the world tried to rid himself of all of his earthly possessions, they could never snatch his heart's true joy. The world could never take Christ from his heart. And when Christ was the center of Paul's joy, when his earthly hands held no earthly treasure in the same way, except Christ, Christ was incomparably precious for Paul. Nothing else was like Christ for Paul. And so Christ was exalted in Paul's life. And Christ was exalted in Paul's suffering and death because he believed that even death was gain. And the only way that death is viewed as gain is if you get to go and be with Christ, the one in whom all of his joy was found, the one in view of whom all the earthly goods seem but like trash. Paul could lose the entire world and everything in it and still not have lost anything because he will not have lost Christ, his treasure. Christ was not taken from him. And in death, Christ would finally and fully be given to him. So death, whatever its form, was gain, because he would go to be with Christ, which was far better. So for Paul, every persecution, every beating, every rock, every lash was but a step in that direction. So he could welcome all of it with open arms. That's why the Apostle Paul said that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he could then look at the Caesarean Christians, as he says in Acts 21, 
What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I'm ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for Christ. His will be done. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This then was Paul's secret to enduring suffering, hardship, opposition, and persecution. His secret is this, his belief that Jesus Christ is the most valuable treasure in all of the universe. That is Paul's secret to enduring all that he did, that Jesus Christ is the most valuable treasure in all the universe. Any suffering or hardship he went through, anything that the world tried to take from him, none of those things could ever rid him of Jesus, far from it. In these things, Paul could show that I am more than a conqueror, Christ. In my sufferings, in my hardship, in my affliction, I'm but one step closer home. I'm but one more moment closer to seeing my treasure, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, face to face. He could endure all of it. So friends, that's the secret. Treasuring Jesus Christ in view of or in the actual loss of all things is how you suffer and overcome the trials of this life in a way that honors Christ. That's Paul's secret. Treasuring Jesus Christ in view of and the actual loss of all things is how you suffer and overcome the trials of this life in a way that honors Christ. You have to view Jesus as your invaluable treasure. Everything else will help you in no way. Only seeing Christ as your invaluable treasure hidden in your heart that no persecutor, no devil, No man can ever snatch away. No sickness, no heartache, no hardship, no loss can ever take your blessed Savior from you. That was Paul's secret. Jesus is my treasure, and I can never, ever lose him. So as we look to integrate this truth into our lives, and as we look to suffer and endure in a Christ-centered way, we must do three things. First, We must believe, and this is the hardest part, that Jesus is in fact the most valuable treasure in the world. You must believe that nothing in this life ever compares to Christ in value. You must believe that the gift of having Christ, of being in relationship with him, is the greatest gift you can ever have or ever be given. Friends, might you learn to be like the men in Jesus' parable in Matthew 13 of the hidden treasure of the pearl of great price who upon finding it sold everything that they had in joy to get it. Second, you must believe that in light of this truth, all things that you could have in this life are rubbish in comparison to Christ. Money, accolades, Nice cars and nice homes, nice jobs. Thousands of people flocking to you on social media. Freedom from heartache or pain or disease. All of it is rubbish. All of it is refuse. You must believe that in comparison to Christ. That does not mean, however, that you don't love people or enjoy the good gifts Of God's creation. For what does the Apostle Paul say? Do not reject anything that's received with prayer and with thanksgiving. God's creation, as we know in Genesis 1, is good. What it means, though, is we can never ascribe to worldly things an ultimate sense of value like we ascribe to a heavenly thing, Jesus Christ. We can never find the world, or any of its goods ever to be our ultimate source of satisfaction. You can enjoy earthly things, but you can never enjoy them ultimately. You can never give to them your ultimate allegiance, for that only belongs to Christ. We must see them in such a way that when we hold them up next to Jesus Christ, they're rubbish in comparison. Yes, you may have the most beautiful spouse or the nicest car, or the loveliest homes here in Fremont. I cannot deny that to you. But when you compare it to Christ, any of those things are like garbage at the dump in Milpitas. All of it is garbage in comparison to Christ. That's why the psalm says, the son of David is the fairest 
and the loveliest of all the sons of men. The book of Song of Songs says that Jesus is like the red rose among the lily of the white valley. Nothing compares to Christ. So then you must learn, as the Apostle Paul says, to eat or to drink or to enjoy any earthly good or person for Jesus and for his glory. As John Piper once said, we have to learn how to eat a peach to the glory of Christ and to not do so idolatrously. Remember, as Ecclesiastes says, if you try to pursue any of the worldly things in their own sake and for their own sake, it's a chasing after the wind. You will be unhappy in the end and you will die and everyone will forget you. So pursue Christ, enjoy Christ. Third, we must cry out to God for his grace. We need God's grace, one, to believe these truths, but secondly, when we suffer or when we face hardship or the opposition comes to us, we need his grace to believe these truths. For friends, left to our own devices, our flesh, weak and frail as it is, will feel that we've, in the loss of these earthly things, lost something of true value and of true significance. And if we look at our loss like that, we will weep and wail and mourn like the world. So we must fight the fight of faith by the empowering grace of God's Spirit to believe that only in God's presence is there fullness of joy. Only at his right hand in Christ are there pleasures forevermore, pleasures which moth and rust and robbers or fire can never take away or destroy. You must fight the fight of faith to remain faithful all your days, and by faith count all things as lost, so that we, like the Apostle Paul, could stretch out our hands by faith and take hold of he who has taken hold of us, our treasure, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that with Paul we can say, the Lord's will be done. And we can welcome heartache or suffering or persecution or loss or death if the Lord so chooses. Friends, let us remember then that we suffer in a Christ-centered way And we embrace this secret when we treasure Jesus Christ above all things as our earthly and heavenly treasure. So whether we actually lose all for Christ or merely we consider such things as loss, friends, we'll have lost nothing because Jesus Christ is our all and in all. Might God be so pleased to make us like those who find Christ as our invaluable treasure and welcome all things as loss in comparison to him. Let us pray. Our good God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that you've given us Christ, our invaluable treasure. Lord, how we pray that we would be people who could take this secret to heart, believe it, and be transformed more into your likeness. Oh God, persecution is coming. Suffering will come. That much is assured. But Lord, would you make us a holy and spirit-filled people who are so content in Christ so happy in our blessed Lord that we could welcome suffering and trials and hardship when they come. Because whatever we may lose in this life, we'll never lose Christ. And Lord, may we be people who know with rock-solid assurance that you wait for us in our heavenly home. You long for us to come home and to embrace us in your loving arms. Oh Lord, make us people who long for nothing more than your presence. Make it so that you're glorified and we are satisfied in you. Amen. So at this time, ooh, sorry. At this time, we're going to enter into time of prayer uh, to respond to the message of God that He has given us. We are to consider the value of Jesus Christ in our life. How much is Jesus Christ worth to you? That is the secret that he has shared with us. How much we treasure Jesus Christ and what he has done for us and who he is as God, the Son of God, will be the motivating factor of our soul. So at this time, let us kind of do soul search uh, for the first prayer prompt. What is stopping you from cherishing Jesus Christ? What is stopping you? And we seriously consider what is stopping us from cherishing Jesus Christ and
go to God. And if the Spirit convicts you, repent that you are cherishing something else more than Jesus Christ. Let us enter into time of repentance. I want us to pray. Are you hearing the voice of God? And I don't mean like audible way, but are you hearing the voice of Jesus Christ? Is he part of your walk in faith daily? Is scripture speaking to you? At this time, I want us to consider the verse that Uh, Cameron has shared with us John chapter 10 verse 16 that we will hear his voice that he is our shepherd and when we hear his voice we will follow him but are we hearing his voice at all right there are many voices in our life that is going on but do we treasure Jesus Christ enough to hear his voice this time I want us to spend in time in hearing his voice Lord through the scripture that we have heard through the message that we have hearing his voice perhaps Jesus Christ is speaking to you at this moment convicting you of you wanting you to commit your life of treasuring him because of how much he loves you because how much he cherishes you. Perhaps today is the day that you get to realize of how much he cherishes you and that he died for you on the cross so that we can be part of the family of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Maybe today is the day that you commit your life to be like Paul. willing to suffer willing to die because it compares not to the suffering of Jesus Christ that it is an, actually an honor to suffer for Jesus Christ who loved us to the point of giving his life perhaps today is the day when you get to cherish truly of Jesus Christ so at this time let us pray listen to his voice through the scripture, through the sermon. Perhaps today is the day that you make the decision to live for him and to willing to be suffering for him because he is worth it. Let us pray.
prayer prompt for today. And then we're going to have time of responding in praise. Um, let's focus and harp on, on the Colossians chapter 3. Doing all things, everything that we do, whether we drink, whether we eat, whether we walk, whether we work, whether we interact with another person, that we do it for the glory of God. Because he is worth it. commit today if you are Christ follower and if you profess that he is worthy of it all that we'll do everything whether we breathe whether we walk whether we wake up whether we drink whether we brush our teeth no matter what we'll do it for the glory of God for Jesus Christ let us pray and conviction and commit to the Lord Praise the Lord. together what gift of grace what gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and free my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. in me. The night is dark. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor in weakness and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this i hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, no fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid for Jesus' blood. Suffer 
follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew until I stand with joy before the throne to Father, we thank you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, and showing us and revealing us and showing your kindness and love to us, yet we were sinners. We thank you. You are worth it. Today, we want to make a commitment to stand and walk for your glory, Lord. We want to live like Apostle Paul. It was not that lifestyle was not just reserved for the apostle but it was also meant for us so we want to live for you powerfully for your glory lord so every day please help us cherish you more and more let us dive into the grace and the love that you have shown let us swim in your love lord daily so that we can be motivated to live for you, Lord, like Apostle Paul. Lord, we thank you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.